The conservatives they came to me, and asked in humility, but I am allowed to have my thoughts, my feelings, right. To which I mean, yes. Just something to note, the relevance of banning assault rifles, Sandahook promise, I may not be easily swayed, but I can be swayed. Are these statements connected? I mean, yes, but I didn't make the connection for you. Apoliticism, why your political opinions are bad. Whenever something comes to the point of being politically relevant, such signals that there is something seriously wrong. That is, there is a serious problem. This can be because there is indeed something seriously wrong that ought to be dealt with. There may be a real problem. This is a real possibility. But the point is that such actually indicates that there is something wrong, regardless of if there is a real problem undergirding the wrongness. It isn't necessarily wrong because it is politicized, but its politicization actually entails that there is something wrong. One can in that way understand the politico as a means of measuring when something is wrong, and what that wrong thing is. Unfortunately, something can be politicized, and hence also create a serious problem. Its politicization already entails that something is wrong, regardless of if there is a serious problem or not. Its politicization is a wrongness in the socio-cultural reality. Much in the same way as an argument indicates that there is something wrong, some disharmony between people. But it is also the case that simply in virtue of politicizing something, that one thereby creates a serious problem. Current examples folks ought seriously consider, and seriously consider politically backing away from. Feminism. Believe it or not feminism used to not be significantly political. That is, folks didn't particularly view it as an issue that was left, right or center. Folks may or may not have agreed with certain takes within feminism, but there wasn't really a political element to it. Rather, there were socio-cultural elements to it, with disagreements as to how that would play out. Again, not with the also statement that there ought be something politically done about it. Which isn't to say that there ought not be something done about it. In other words, what ought be done is actionable things, real-world activities, living the reality, and making the cultural changes necessary simply by the doing of the things. For instance, having women enter the workforce en masse wasn't a particularly political thing. There wasn't, for the most part at any rate, any particular law or indeed any particular political opposition to women doing so. There were folks who disagreed with it, but the movement to have women enter the workforce en masse was largely apolitical. It was a cultural movement, not a political movement. It was not a particularly controversial thing politically, because no one made it a political issue in the first place. I think folks really ought to let that sink in. There was not significant political opposition to women entering the workforce, or indeed, much of the basic stances of feminisms, all the way into the 1990s. And yet much later, long after women entered the workforce en masse, it was made into a political thing by attempts to, on the one hand, pass laws to enforce the matter, and on the other hand, to cast the opposition party as being supposedly opposed to the point. By doing so, perhaps even more so the latter than the former, a serious problem was created via the politic. Whereas before there was basically no organized opposition to women being in the workforce, there has become effectively a major political party that has the character of opposing it. Even though I don't think that political party really holds to that belief, the political party being cast in the negative light as if they were nonetheless risks taking on that appearance, and to some extent has begun to take on those characteristics. They are all lies of course, but as is the reality here, when a political lie is spoken oft enough, in this case that one political party is opposed to women in the workforce, or more broadly is opposed to feminism, there is a serious risk of manifesting that into the reality via the culture. Environmentalism is another good example in recent history. Neither major party used to be opposed to and not destroying the environment. I know, shocker. There used to be broad political agreement on it, it was a non-issue as a matter of especially national politics at any rate. Then someone started to make it political. 
No longer were there basic realities that had to be dealt with, Hamada admired the democratic process, instead there was a politicized problem that defined which team you were on. This example is a little less clear because oft there were real political disagreements on a local level that had to do with businesses, and a not in my backyard kind of problems. Local politics, in other words. But as a matter of broad national understanding it wasn't a real question that there was a problem that had to be dealt with. Merely questions of exactly how to go about dealing with it. This changed as it became politicized on a national level, and note that in this case the right-wingers politicized the issue, whereas in the former case it was the left-wingers that politicized the issues. Now, the problem with politicization as each of these examples illustrates is that for something to be political there has to be a difference of opinions on it. To make environmentalism political, there has to actually be an opposition to the view that not destroying the environment is a good thing. Likewise, to make feminism political, there has to be an opposition to gender equality is a good thing. Same for issues with racism. For race to be political, there has to be an opposition to the notion that race is bad. In each of these instances, there may be actual differences of opinion regarding how to handle the environmental disasters we are facing, cause they are fucking environmental disasters that do threaten pretty much everyone you There may be differences in how exactly do we make things more or less equal between the genders, and how do we handle the racism in the current and the legacies of it. Those are not politicized problems though. Those are pragmatic issues that amount to actually pretty boring stuff tbh. You don't win elections that way winking smiley. You don't get screaming crowds of adoration with such stunning words. You don't rile up the base, left, right, or center that way. You just deal with the actual problems. It's worse than that though. It is also that folks may actively work against the solving of the problems, because their entire political life amounts to there being a problem to solve. There isn't a current incarnation of the political left, without there being made the boogeyman out of the right as a troglodyte bent on putting women in chains and beating them until they make that dinner. Where's my dinner Cheryl? Nor would there be the current incarnation of the political right, without there being made the boogeyman out of the left as coming with big gov to take away your freedoms in the name of saving the planet from the hoax of man-made climate change. They simply don't have much else to them as a matter of actual problems to be solved, so instead they make them into political issues and thereby they create the problems. It is incumbent upon people to understand that political styled solutions are not generally particularly desirable sorts of solutions. Sometimes they are necessary, sometimes they are even goods, the correct sorts of things to be done. But politics isn't and really ought not be a go-to kind of solution. What could take decades, centuries even via politics, creating divisiveness and hardships along the way, can often not be accomplished in a matter of a few years by simply doing the proper sorts of things in one's own lives, talking with one's local community, making commitments to do the proper sorts of things in one's own life, and so forth, with the fringe benefit of building and forward slash or strengthening local communities in the process. Again, it is important to note that sometimes there ought be political solutions, sometimes that is the correct, the good sort of thing to do. A significant problem with folks' current political opinions though is that they are taking for granted that politics is definitely the proper forum to handle various issues. There simply isn't any real thought given to the matter as to if a given issue ought or ought not be politically oriented in its solutions. Note also this is markedly different than holding to the strange and paranoid fears prevalent on the right about big gov or the left about big corp taking their freedoms away. Sometimes big gov or big corp are appropriate kinds of solutions to problems. Why my political opinions are so fucking good? For one thing, I am discerning enough of the aforementioned role and limitations of politics so as to not make some things political, and to also see through the political BS in the current. In other words, I can distinguish reasonably well, 
or indeed at all when compared to too many folks, between those kinds of issues that ought be political in their solutions, and those that ought not be political in their solutions. This has as an almost fringe benefit to it the capacity to discern which side in a given BS political debate is the correct side with relative ease. Not being caught up in the lies involved entails a fairly simple capacity to note which side, sometimes if any, are correct. This is deeper than merely noting that BC it ought not be political, whichever side is trying to make it political is necessarily wrong. What I am able to do is utilize the proper set of tools for understanding to discern the matter BC I am not already caught up in the lies. Rather than responding to this or that lie, this or that political position, this or that style of political solution, talking point, etc., firstly frame the issues in their proper, non-political context. From that position it is typically, perhaps always idk, rather obvious which side is correct, if any, or at times, how an issue may have merits of worth on both or all sides of the matter. I perhaps too flippantly hold to the view that the proper framework for understanding is the philosophical one, but such is in point of fact often not the case. Sometimes I hold to the view that the fractal perspective is the proper perspective, which is at least more obviously specific, folks often enough being tripped up as to what philosophy even is. Regardless, the point for this little piece is that by coming at a given issue via the correct framework of understanding, the proper solutions are often enough rather clear and straightforward. Why my political views are apolitical? The preceding points ought be clear enough as to why such is the case. My political views are apolitical BC they are generally neither derived from nor particularly interested in the politics. By viewing the political with the proper framework, the derivative opinions are not caught up in whatever the political may be or have to say on the matter. It is in some sense, albeit this is a bit misleading, like looking upon the situation from afar. This is misleading because the position from which I am looking at it is the proper one, it is up close and personal to the issue properly speaking. The political simply wasn't the proper viewpoint at all, the view from afar, in the pejorative, is actually the political one, relative to the actual issue. When looking from afar upon the political though, it's fairly plain that they aren't even remotely close to the issue, properly speaking. Politics as Dramarama Although I do not want to suggest that politics either is merely or worse yet or to be about Dramarama, to the degree that politics is not dealing with, hum, real relevant political issues, it becomes and indeed is merely limited to dramarama. This is most revealing and well revealed by way of the aristocracies, the monarchies, the queens and kings of old. Whereby much of the politics thereby amounted to proximity to the throne, whom so happens to be in the good graces, or in the bad graces of the aristocracies are thereby granted weal or woe. There becomes thereby little more, though not nothing, to the politic than the jockeying to be near the seat of power. It is hardly the case though that such political vapors as those are so limited to the aristocracies of old, or any in the new. In the currents whereby the politics have become stagnant, whereby that bout which the politic or be concerned have become taboo to be concerned about, what remains to be done is slander and brown nosing. Whom is sleeping with whom, and how incestuous are the relations becomes the totality of the politics. In these situations, the more incestuous the sexual relationships the better. To be sleeping with the enemy, after all is to be a fucking outside the family. Here, perhaps because it deserves to be spoken of and yet it is difficult to find a proper placement for it, we can perhaps grasp at the reality of differences. The validity of emotions, yes, but also the validity of differing thoughts, differing ideas. The reality of them as being pertinent to the person. They aren't wrong, they aren't in need of being corrected, they are just literally different. This is a very hard point of order for folks to grasp at, for what it worth, and may be a worth a great deal tbh, see the odd questions of privilege, a slight history of colonialism for a good depiction of the relevant and salient points. Here though we can get some non-trivial sense of the point by holding that a non-dramarama politics is one that actually manages to juggle those balls winking smiley. The other views are, at any rate, 
not necessarily wrong, though they can or may be, they just different. Strangely, ironically, this is most clear via the fates. Differing fates are not wrong, there isn't some argument that can be made to demonstrate that the one or the other is correct, and the point of the politic isn't to prove or show that this or that one is incorrect, if it ever comes to that the politico has fundamentally failed and devolved to war. The point of the politic is to hold these differing fates together, not even separately, but rather, to be capable of holding them all together at all. Such that this and that one actually exist, and their existence is not a thing that is to be put in question, certainly not at any rate via the politic. Importantly, this applies well to such things as differing cultures, in which case, critically importantly, this applies to differing modalities of gendered expressions, the queers exist, be thankful they do too or you'll be fucked in all the bad connotations of that highly ambiguous term winking smiley. The politic diffuses what might otherwise be fused dispositions. If it isn't doing this, it isn't succeeding in its charges. Here folks ought understand that the politic has a few purposes to it. Sometimes it is to handle real serious issues. That is important stuff. Sometimes it's just to manage things, juggle those balls in their mouth, to handle things so that they don't get out of hand. In the former the drama of it all is super dumb, it is counterproductive to its aim. In the latter, the dramarama might exactly be the appropriate sort of thing. In the former, folks or take the politico seriously, the debate really matters, the bluff and bluster of it all actually matters, the fights are real, and they are standings for war where we prefer not to war. In the latter a lack of action at all is the appropriate sort of thing. The concern for who is sleeping with whom becomes the order of the day. More to the point, in the former, sleeping with the enemy is important, the incestuousness becomes a problem, a problem only soluble via spreading that love. Why folks have beliefs that make no sense? They are polluted via the political discourse. They are simply caught up within the lies of the political discourse, and hence, their opinions are quite literally based on and concerned about the lies in the discourse. It is exactly like having an opinion about the color of Harry Potter's socks. There are a variety of reasons why they might be this or that color, there could be evidence that supports this or that claim even, and that discourse could theoretically go on fairly well indefinitely, until someone decides to cut it off. But no matter what the opinion, the reasons, or evidence, even good evidence and reasons, because there is no actual fact of the matter none of it really makes sense. Taking the political discourse seriously is pretty much akin to this. Perhaps in the currents the most prevalent and potentially dangerous sort of political discourse of this sort is that which surrounds racism. There is good evidence and reasons for having this or that opinion on the matter, racism is bad, but ultimately there isn't really an actual fact of the matter. Hence all opinions on racism beyond the very obvious are, well, very odd. Insofar as there are valid opinions to have on the matter, it is merely because the political discourse itself is holding it up. There remains therein some rationale for potentially engaging with the political discourse nonetheless, namely, as a matter of pragmatics to deal with the situation as it is. Likewise, and this is important, there are and may be legacy issues with racism, or systemic issues with racism that are derived from the legacy of racism, even if all the racisms were to stop. But the reality is that at best that can merely be a stopgap kind of measure. Ultimately the only way to actually defeat racism is to stop doing the racism. To approach it from a proper view, racism is held up at least in part via the political discourses. The other major pillar and in some sense more serious kind of pillar of racism is the derivative of the sexual dynamics, the irrational fear of the stranger. See the rape of this one series for an understanding of how that is functioning. The more foundational aspects of the political discourses lie structure are nationalism and money. Neither of these are real in the relevant sense of that term, they are merely predicated and predicable upon lies. Opinions about what is the character of a country have no real answer to it. 
One can respond with better or worse sorts of answers, one can even back up one's answers with evidence, but that evidence is either entirely or primarily predicated upon the lie itself, namely, the supposition that there is this real entity called a nation to which we are referring to, or that there is this real entity called a monetary value to which we are referring to. The problem is deeper than this though, because there is some degree whereby the lies do in point of fact take on a reality to them. In other words, simply via the pretense of the nationalistic structure, there comes about to be some sort of actual structure by way of the bodies of the people who believe in such things, who profess such things, and who enact such things. Professors, be thee, and be thy wary thereof. Here the main point for the gentler readers, or even the hostile readers, to get though is that there are no sane beliefs that take this question seriously, what color are Harry Potter's socks? Nor again these far more familiar questions. What is the national character of a given country? What are the rules for monetary valuation? What are the realities of race? These questions are simply lies in the first place, the answers to which are more aptly handled by noting their fantastical ontology. So called out they become centered in all their fantastical glory, sacred cows come bowed to their butcherer. Is there room for the fantastical though? The short answer is yes. The questions are about how seriously we take them, and what roles they may play. Among other things, we might do well to distinguish between lies and the merely fantastical. Lies have a deceptor behind them, a deceiver who rather deliberately presents the merely fantastical as if it were something other than. As if its ontology were in point of fact the real. The merely fantastical however, doesn't make any particular pretense to its being something other than. In some, somewhat ironic sense, it therefore pertains itself to the reality. Its ontological status, in other words, is as real as it claims to be. The fantastical having of itself an ontology, and though there is some ambiguity in the terms here, the ontology does purport itself among other things to be denoting the real. In this case we can perhaps get a good glimpse at one of the more meaningful qualifiers to the ontology's utilization of the term real, the real has the character of pertaining to the proper ontology. To hold that a nice solid cup is in fact merely a fantastical illusion isn't real, not because the cup isn't real, nor because the fantastical isn't real, nor because illusions are not real, but simply in virtue of the ontology of the cup not being of the fantastical or illusory sorts of ontology. The realness of the fantastical lay within its being, in a real sense, pun intended. It sounds strange merely because the terms have a fair amount of ambiguity to them. But here the proper senses of the real are actually being utilized. When folks use the more familiar sense of the real, they are actually typically using the term real as if it were in opposition to the fantastical, and hence that we might distinguish between the fantastical and the real, or the illusion and the real, or the lie and the real. But each of these are ambiguous sorts of usages. The lie is real in the sense that it has of itself an ontology, namely, the ontology of lies. We might even do well to understand the ontology of lies as the deliberate misunderstanding of ontologies. To say the cup is fantastical is to lie because it deliberately misunderstands the ontology of the cup, the real, as the fantastical. The lie is exactly not real because it fails to obtain to a proper ontology. We could hold that there is some non-trivial sense in which the lie is ontologically valid in the sense of its being a lie. The lie's ontology pertains merely to the deliberate misunderstanding of ontologies, in other words. I don't think this is contradictory, and indeed may merely be a fine sort of descriptive statement as to the fundamental nature of lies. Lies can be harmless, or even good, for instance Santa Claus, see the odd questions of privilege, a slight history of colonialism on this point. But here again the main thrust to be getting at is the nature of these kinds of problems. To mistake the national as if it were the real is a categorical error of the ontology, to do so deliberately is to lie. Might we hold that a categorical bad obtains when a lie deliberately misunderstands something real? 
To hold that, for instance, to deliberately misunderstand something that is real, the cop, as if it were not real, mere fantastical, illusion, etc., is a categorical sort of bad. Whereas the deliberate misunderstanding of the fantastical as if it were the real is not a categorical bad. Though such wouldn't be to hold that the latter is a categorical good either. There might need to be an additional qualifier to the point, namely, how serious and with what levities are we deliberately doing such things. To joke about the cup not being real, or to entertain the possibility, as is often enough done in philosophy for instance, is unlikely to be a categorical bad. Whereas to do so with a seriousness may entail a categorical bad. Here the entertaining of a possibility is a kind of levited disposition, one where the finality of the disposition is held at bay, the superpositioning of a view about the real. A joke may be something at least somewhat similar. I've remarked before about the relation between the recognition of the contradiction and humor, the little laugh that comes with the realization of a contradiction, a slight leviting of the state from one of dreadful seriousness to one of lightheartedness. But to lie in all seriousness. To seriously deliberately misunderstand the ontology of something real, perhaps that could be a categorical bad. The thing with lies is that they are all caught up in the subject, the subjective, the deliberateness of it all. That is, what is or isn't particularly ethical about it also at least has of itself the subjective aims involved. It is possible, that is, that someone might lie with good intentions, though I admit that it actually gets kinda difficult to hold that there are possible good positions in the proposed qualified categorical bad of lying. The seriousness qualifier for instance may entail that there are no good intentions possible within it. The fantastical is a different sort of matter though. The merely having, expressing, etc. of the fantastical is not any kind of obvious problem. There is a strong disposition out there that there is something inherently bad about these sorts of things, because folks will tend to believe it. I am uncertain as to if this is the case though. Video game violence, violence does not course. Nationalism is a serious problem, not only because it is a fantasy, but also and more importantly because it is taken so fucking dreadfully seriously. It is a lie, and a rather fantastically large one at that. It is the lying though which presents the merely fantastical as if it were the reality that is the, or at least a significant part of, the significant ethical file that is happening there. The musing of the ontologies, the fantastical as if it were the real. That is perhaps the root ailment of nationalism. Which isn't necessarily to say that nationalism itself is a bad, perhaps, in other words, if it were not ever presented as a lie, if folks were taught from the get-go that it is merely a fantastical sort of thing, that it is mere fantasy, then nationalism wouldn't take on the dreadful seriousness that characterizes its fallacies, its ethical horror shows. Folks could be of a nationality, even celebrate it with fireworks, pomp, and flair, and yet also easily walk away from it if they wanted. Or at any rate, take it off as one does a costume, for costume it be, and interact with people in a manner that isn't so crazed. People warring over the color of Harry Potter's socks. I suspect that this world has yet to experience such a fantastical thing as nationalism understood properly as the fantasy, the fantastical that it really is, but that this little world would, oh but that it would winking smiley. Are y'all talking about Harry Potter's socks or no? Readers, gentle or other than gentle sorts, may be able to draw some kinds of conclusive positions from this, especially as regards one's political dispositions. Are there real-world problems? If yes, then stop the drama-rama. Hint, there are serious real-world problems. So please stop the drama-rama and hammer out a real solution. If no, then understand that you'll ought not ever take too seriously the politic, especially if you're a politician. Fight it out, but abhor the making of policy in such circumstances. All such policy shall be predicated upon lies, for the politic at that point is merely predicated upon lies, and only predicable upon lies. Those lies do a thing though, they juggle my balls in their mouths. It is not unappreciated winking smiley.
Caesar's Jew indeed, my nuts in their mouth. I can see the shine. The Ranyuhan River. Someone. It would have been her. It would have been her.